thank you, worship team. And uh, it's good to be here. Uh, we came, came down from uh, the Midlands yesterday and uh, got to watch my son play some rugby. Any Glenwood supporters yet? Sorry about that. <clears throat> anyway, it's been, uh, it's been uh, I suppose as you arrived this morning, you've seen the rain. We've had some beautiful rain. And uh, we always remind ourselves when the rain falls, faith rises. And I pray that this morning, wherever you've come, I noticed there are a lot of visitors here. It's good to have you with us. And we like to say it nice and simply, welcome home. One of the themes of the Bible, God, there are four sort of things that run through the Bible, one of which is God is always inviting his people to come home. And if you're part of the family here, it's good to have you back. Uh, there's something beautiful about a local church. Um, we all different languages, different colors, different backgrounds, but and yet there's something that holds us all together. It's Jesus amongst us. And so I really pray that today, wherever you're at in your faith journey, that you would have an encounter with him. I know the worship team are great, but we didn't come here for worship team. We came to meet him. I know I might say a few words up here that might make you laugh and smile and, 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 and that, but you didn't come here to hear me. You came to hear Jesus. And uh, you came, I know you came for good coffee, especially on a day like today. Okay, just me. You came for a good coffee, but actually, ultimately, what you really came from is to meet him. And when we meet him, everything changes. And I love the thought of the resurrection. You know, I think we've just come off Easter Sunday, Easter weekend. How those last Easter eggs still around in the house? Hidden them in the back there just for another couple of days through April, May. <laughs> and, uh, and you've hidden them from your kids because like you don't wanna give them more of those. Um, but, but here's the thought, and I, I think it's so true for all of us, um, is that what happens is Easter happens and then we want, what's next? Anyone here? I mean, in life, it's like, okay, what's next? What's new? Where can I go from here? And, and one thing I've realized is that as you read through the gospels and you read through the book of Acts is that, they didn't go on from the resurrection. Acts chapter three, Peter gets up and what does he preach? Resurrection. Stephen gets stoned, Acts six, but he gets up, what does he preach? Resurrection. Acts 13, Paul goes into a foreign city. What does he preach? Resurrection. Resurrection, the forgiveness of sin and you've been justified from all things. In other words, because of what Jesus did for you and I, he's not only just forgiven us, but as Christ was, so, we are, so are we. Whole loved, forgiven before God. And I wonder if, I don't know about you, but I wonder if we hear the resurrection, we go like, mm, beautiful. And then we wanna go into what's next. But I, re I really believe that those who most powerfully move in the kingdom of God are those who continually revisit what God did for us. It's the hinge of history. Something happened in that moment that changed us forever. And so the title of my message today, if you're taking notes, is simply this, the ripple effect. The ripple effect, because I believe that the resurrection has a ripple effect over our lives. It's not something just to be gazed upon. God says, Jesus said, embrace the God life. In other words, I'm not just gonna let it entertain me, I'm gonna embrace it. I'm not just gonna gaze at it from a distance and hear about it, I wanna know it for myself. And the degree to which it gets in you is the degree which is gonna give you power to move forward. Anyone here wanna move forward? I don't know about you, but I wanna move forward. But often what we do is we're like, oh no, that's great, thank you for that. That was a great oh, Easter Sunday, amazing. And then we just move forward. But what, what are we doing? We're going in our own strength. Notice it's, it's the ripple effect, not the ripple event or, or, or effort. You know, because it could be the ripple effort. The effort is like, I'm gonna, I've got saved, but now it's gonna be up to me. I remind myself that Jesus rose again, but let me get back into the office and let me do what I need to do. And so what we do is we get to the grind post, but actually it was never about that. It's not a ripple effort, it's a ripple effect. Two different things. And um, I don't know about you, but uh, I grew up on a farm and uh, we would, you know, as a young boy, you'd, if you found the dam, you would go to the dam and then what you do is you find the biggest stone and you want to take the biggest stone and throw it into the dam. And as it hit the water, it was like, a ripple effect. So, so someone's helping me. Thank you. And then, and then, and then once a year we climb up on a mountain, the Drakensberg, and I go with some friends and often family. And I don't know it's about men, but something happens when they get up on the top of a mountain. One of them has to shout, "Wow!" Like that, or something like that. It's like, "Wow!" 
Wow. They just like the echo. They like, yeah, they like the sound of their own voice echoing. But the same, the same is with our Christian life, friends. Something happened that's gonna cause a ricochet in your life. And it's not gonna be on your effort. It's the effect that was caused because of the power of God. Something that started in you is gonna sustain your life. Man, I don't know about you, but I wanna know what that is. You know, Christmas time, we get around the tree and there's gifts around the tree. And we're like, hmm. I've got some gifts at Christmas, but do you know that post-resurrection, Jesus had more gifts for us? We think Christmas is about getting gifts. No, but Jesus opens his bag to the disciples that were fearful, and he says, let me open my treasure chest. I've got some gifts for you and you, you today. And I think we don't wanna leave it there. We wanna, we wanna revisit it. You know, I've got, um, and we've got some family members. I just wanna put a picture. I've got a picture of our family member here. Um, there we go, look at that. He's the, she, she's the sixth family member. We've got five human beings, then we've got two dogs. One's called Rosie, she, she's black, and, and this is Honey, we call her Hun Buns. And um, Hun Buns is a rescue dog. She, she was well treated when she was younger, had wire in her mouth, did a whole things, but she's become an incredible blessing in our home. But as you can see, Honey's got like a funny look in his eyes there, he's not too pleased with me. And, uh, and, and you know what it is when you get young, you know when, you, when, you, when you, you're young and married, it's like the dog comes into the kitchen, then the, in, from the kitchen to the foyer, and then from the foyer to the bedroom, and then you have children, and then you choose, children or dogs? And then we made a decision, no dogs outside, children inside. And, and you know what it's like when you have dogs in the house, it's, it's one thing you desperately need as a parent, you need a good hoover. You know, because it's for your kids and your dogs. And, and it got to that stage where we had two dogs, all seven of us in the house, and it's just hairy, and I'm thinking like, we need a hoover. And you know what, hoovers, they last, they're like, a bit like your toaster and your kettle. You have to replace it every three months. And so Kath, my wife, went out and she found a deal. She was like, you know, when it gets to the end of January and you, your credit card feels like it's about to burn. And she thought, no, I'm gonna go to the SPC and get a deal. There was, must have been a great marketing guy there. I've told this story before, but she got a hoover, an Electrolux superpower for 450 rand. Yo, she came back, there she is. She came back and she was like, mm, mm, I found it. And you know, I took it like I took that Electrolux. That thing was made in the 90s. Anyway, I took it and I plugged it in like this and it, 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 as I plugged it in, it sounded like a small aircraft in our room. Like, it was so noisy. And then, and then, and then I thought, now I'm gonna test this. Because you see, when you see, you see new Hoover, you see new house. And we put that thing down. I'm just going over the carpet. I'm like, woo, this is amazing, amazing. And so Kath says, just stop for a moment. Let's see if it's working. So we turn it off like this. We open where, we, where there should be material. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And, and here's the thing. And, and here's the point. You know what? You can have all the noise in the world, but what we desperately need is power. You know, you can make a noise. We can spin around. We can make a noise about the resurrection. But what we desperately need, when Jesus came along, you know what he did? He gave us power. Power. And he often asked us, revisit it just like the early church did. And today I want to read a script to you, a text that is around the early believers. And you know what the early believers were? They were in a house locked up and they were all on their own, terrified. You know what I don't see in the Gospels? I don't see any of the believers standing out the tomb going, five, four, three, two, one. None of them. You know, they, they didn't wait there going like, oh, oh, Jesus is back, awesome. We were waiting for you, Jesus. No, the, the, the early believers are just like you and I, terrified, not sure. But like, you know, when we get sucked up on Sunday at church and then Tuesday comes, we go like, oh my gosh, my knees are shaking. How am I gonna get through life? They were just the same as you and I. Same predicament, fearful, locked up in a room, but God comes into the room and he says, I've got good news for you. I've got a treasure chest for you. Now, before I read the text, here's something that we often battle with. I don't know about you, but whether from the back to the front, life gives you problems. You just have to live and you're gonna encounter them. But there's something all about, we all got unique problems, but there's a common thread to those problems and it's undertoned by the simple thought or root. It's like, if to be really honest, the one thing we wanna do is often for us as humanity is we wanna have things over again. If I could get my last 10 years of marriage back again, if I could have my, my last career, my last 10 years of my life and my career back again. If I could get my hair back again. <laughs> if, I, if I could get my figure, we talk to the ladies for a moment. If I could get my figure 
back again? Uh, uh, what about if I could get my face back again? If I could get my eyebrows back again? I don't know, fill in the gap. But there's often as human beings, there's this thought like hey, nothing's ever gonna change. And what it is really in humanity, there is this thirst for new. And Jesus comes at the resurrection in the front and the face of humanity. And he stands there and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Behold, all things are new in me. To a thirsty world that's looking for change. To a thirsty world that goes, I've been, had mistakes, I've had regrets in my life. Jesus stands in front of this and he goes, you can have new if you have me. What a promise from God. And so he opens up his treasure chest to a fearful uh, humanity. You know, Jesus, he, he says to Mary, encounters Mary, he says, Mary, he says, go and tell my brothers. First time Jesus used the word brothers. Go and tell my brothers I'm going ahead of him. What a word of grace. You know, if I was Jesus, I would say, go and tell those st- backstabbing, scared little boys, I'm gonna see you ahead of you, you know? He doesn't do that. Why? Because his grace has never been about our performance. It's about his. It's about his record, his past, and what he's done for us. Brothers, I come into the room this morning. He says, brothers, I come ahead of you with a gift. Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. That's the resurrection. And if he rose there and he gave gifts to his church, guess what? He's alive today and he has gifts for you and I. Let's read this text together and then I'll give you, there's four gifts that he gives you and I as we set out on the back end of Resurrection Sunday. Let me read the text. It says, verse 36 and uh, Luke chapter 24. Just to give you some context, as I said earlier, these disciples are in a room in Jerusalem. They're pretty nervous and scared. And it says, while they were saying all this, Jesus appeared to them and said, peace be with you. They thought they were seeing a ghost and were scared half to death. He continued with them, don't be upset and don't let all these doubting questions take over. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's really me. Touch me. Look me over from head to toe. A ghost doesn't have muscle and bone like this. As he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. They still couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was too much. It seemed too good to be true. Verse 41, he said, and he asked, do you have any food here? And they gave him a piece of leftover fish they had cooked. He took it and ate it right before their eyes. Verse 44, he said, then he said, everything I told you while I was with you comes to this. All things written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets and in the Psalms have to be fulfilled. Everything in this Bible points to him. He went on to open the understanding of the word of God. Would you do that today again, God? Showing them how to read their Bibles this way. What was this way? Do you know there's a way to read your Bible? And he said, this is how you should read it. You can see now how it is written that the Messiah suffers, rises from the dead, and on the third day, then a total life change. A total life change. What Jesus offers us is not one gig or two gigs. He offers us an uncapped, changed life. I love how Tim Keller said, Christianity is not about being nice, it's about being new. I just, I, thought, I just thought for a moment, you know, often our thinking is, well, I've come to Christ and He rose again, it's just gonna be nice. Nice is such a poor adjective, don't you think? How was your day? I had such a nice day. You know, and I think as Christians, we're like, we just add another layer. Let it be nice. But Christianity was never being about nice, it was being about new. Total life change. From the inside out, it's new, not nice. Nice shows me that, well, my thinking is, well, it's just a little add-on to my life. No, the Bible says total change from the inside out. New life. He proclaimed to all the nations, starting from here to Jerusalem. That's a ripple effect. You're the first to hear it and see it. He looks at you, Link Church, this morning. He says, you the witnesses. What comes next is very important. I'm sending my father promise to you to stay here in the city until he arrives, until you are equipped with power from on high. Verse 50, he said, he led them out out of the city over to Bethany. Raising his hands, he blessed them. And while blessing them, made his exit, being carried up to heaven. The last words of Jesus on the cross were, it is finished. But the last words before he ascended were blessing. Blessing, and he exited blessing. 
Jesus is still blessing, blessing over his people, blessing over his sons and daughters, blessing over families, blessing over your workplace, blessing over your life. The words of Jesus to humanity are blessing. And they were on their knees worshiping him and they returned to Jerusalem bursting with joy. They spent all their time in the temple praising God and it ends with yes and amen. Now I don't know about you, but there's one thing when Jesus leaves, it's almost like an oxymoron. He goes and yet they're filled with joy. What was it about these early believers that had such power inside of them that in spite of him going, they held on to joy? What was it? You know what they had? They recognized that in the resurrection, there were gifts on hand, gifts for you and I, the same gifts given into that room we have access today. You know, I thought about this for a moment and I'm just reminded because often we can get confused around this because we think it's up to us. But you know, I thought about this for a moment. Uh, uh, my son, he's, he played a cup in, up in Pretoria and uh, I would take a flight up there. I'd fly up there to watch him play. And uh, I'm, I was, I'm a farming background, so any thought of getting into an international airport often scares me, especially when I'm on my own. And anyway, you arrive at Joburg International Airport and you get out the thing and everyone likes to walk really fast in the airport. Have you noticed that? Everyone's like, geez, and I'm just like, I'm mumbling through like that, looking at my watch, saying, oh, okay. Everyone, everyone's on a mission, going somewhere. So anyway, you get in behind them and you go, go like this and then you think, okay, I need to rent a car. So you go out those doors and you go out the elevator and then as you come on the top, you notice there are about 20 different options. And I'm like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And then you go, oh, Hertz. Okay, you walk into the Hertz office. I remember walking in there and I look at the lady and you know, she says, oh, so what, sir, what vehicle are you looking for? I said, a Porsche 911. <laughs> so she like, you know, like laughs, whatever. And I laugh and I'm like, and then we laugh and then she laughs. And I, <laughs> she's not sure whether to believe me. And then, and, then, and then I say, and then I look like that and I turn around to the guy next to me. I said, what's your cheapest option? <laughs> and then she says, no, sir, I got a Renault. You know, the one liter Renault. I used to have a Renault. And the challenge with that is you realize when the first hill you go, you can turn the aircon off, otherwise you go backwards. And, 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 and you know the Renault, and, and I said, thank you so much. And you sign like this, you give your ID, you take the keys. And she says, as her parting words, as you walk out there, it's, it's, num- it's I'll D, uh, your car is number 324. And you're like, and you walk out and the doors open and you just see this garage filled with cars. And you know what it's like, you've got A, and then there's B, and then there's C. Three kilometers later, you find road D. And then you walk as D like this, and you go down the aisle, and you know you got your, have you ever walked out of a shopping center and lost where you parked your car? Okay. So you know what happens, you take your remote out like that, and you walk like that, because you don't want to show anyone, you're confident. Hmm? Beep. And you look for a flash. <laughs> and then, because your peripheral vision's blocked this side, you do another beep like that. Any flash? You're trying to remain as calm as you can. You know? Everything's fine. And uh, as I walk down like this, I'm like, I pull up my remote. I'm like, mm, 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 mm. And eventually you get to D whatever thing. And there's that Renault in all its glory. Yo! I walk towards it. Like, mm, mm, mm. And you know what a procedure is? It's just to find and open the boot. Now, do you click the boot and then you go to the back and you're like, bang. And then you like, and then you realize the boot's open from the inside. And you go around, you get the thing in your boot and then you get into the vehicle, into the Renault. And it's unbelievable. It's got everything. Bluetooth. But you know what the scariest thing is the next 300 meters as you exit that garage. Because you don't know where the normal flick is because it's not your normal car. So then you like the Bluetooth, the air, the air, the handbrake, and you're driving out there and it's like, and you know, you know in the garage, you've got an exit side everywhere. So you just, 30 minutes later, you're driving like exit, like a, <laughs> cheers. And you drive around again and it's like, <laughs> exit. <laughs> I'm like, somebody take me out. And, and, and you know what? When you're sitting in this Renault, you're sitting in there like, you know what the challenge is? It's not that the car doesn't have everything. It does. It's just you trying to learn to drive it. And I thought to myself, it's the same with salvation. God has given you everything you need. It says the fullness of God has been placed into your heart, grace upon grace. In other words, he's gonna give you grace to learn to drive it. You see, you have everything you need. Everything is like access. But the challenge is sometimes we're not accessing what we already have. I wonder if the resurrection is this place that happens and there's a momentum shift that happens. Everything was given to you. Now will you learn to drive it? Because it's gonna take a new mindset. It's gonna take this understanding and a reminder of revisiting what he did for us and the gifts he has available for us. The first gift is this. Peace be with you. Now, 
peace be with you. You know what Jesus does? Jesus satisfies the greatest um, need of our human hearts by eating a meal with his people. In the Old Testament, to meet, eat a meal with someone was a sign of not just I'm eating a meal, it's friendship and intimacy. It's relationship. What Jesus, now, I don't know about you, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking peace, it's that beach in Mauritius. You think, oh, that's where I find peace. For some of you, you're thinking peace is when I meditate. shabba dabba dabba da. you know, you just like, empty my mind. I just want peace. Put me in my room, I wanna be, no, but that's not the peace that I'm talking about. You see, because peace is not the absence of problems. Peace is the presence of a person. Jesus beams into the room. Can you imagine that? You know, sometimes we, oh, we laugh about that, but can you imagine it? Into the room. How are you guys doing? Peace be with you. And you know, do you remember, do you remember Noah when he let the dove out? And the dove went to look for land, but it couldn't land. Couldn't land, came back, couldn't land. I think Jesus came in there and he gave peace, but it could, the, the peace couldn't land in hearts. Why? because those disciples were so terrified. Here's the thought, friends, you can't hold on to fear and then expect to get peace. You gotta let go of that fear. We do not have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Jesus comes and says, let go of that. I know we got fear, fear is around. Fear is, a, is, is like we learned the other day, it's a, good, motiv it's a poor, good motivator of a poor builder. But God said, you weren't born for fear. Faith says, he's in the room here right now, will you receive him? Jesus walks in and he offers us himself. You know what he's saying in another reason? You know, I, I drove down last night, I spent the night with my mum, and um, it was actually my dad's birthday in heaven yesterday, he turned 77, which is amazing. And for some of you know, he, went, he passed away two years ago. But I sleep in the same room that he left in. It's weird, it's like, well, it's not weird, but that's where I sleep, it's fine. But, but the funny thing is, you know when someone dies, you, you keep a, a pair of shoes or you, clothes, or my dad's got some tools in his garage, and when I see it, I just remember him, but you know, it's such a, when someone dies, it's such a vague way of having a relationship with someone, you know, you, you, you know, the, yes, his tools are there, yes, you know, but actually, you want more than that, you want, I want my dad, I, I want to see him, and what Jesus is saying, he's saying, listen, I, here, here I come, I'm offering you myself, and, and, and I think, to be honest, you, you might not admit this, but I think for a lot of us, we grow up with this thinking, you know, one day I'm gonna find that person. He or she, like the famous words of that movie, is gonna complete me. Yeah, yeah. I, I. <laughs> she is gonna be the one. She's gonna bring wholeness to my brokenness. He's gonna be the guy, you know. You're gonna be my soulmate. And, 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 and I'm thinking like, where does this thinking come from? Because to be honest, and, and, you, know, you, you, you won't admit to the person next to you, but you admit it to me. When you were 12 or 14, remember you read that book or watched that movie and you got a crush on someone and you were like, oh, and you fantasize. There's us walking back into the sunset. Everything's gonna be fine. And then we take that projection and we put on the person we're gonna marry. And we go, oh, she's the one. She's the one. But that's, we know that there is no one in this world that could ever meet your expectations. Because if we put all our expectations on someone, they are gonna die under the expectation. There's no one. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is someone. And his name is Jesus Christ. And you know what he does? He comes into the room like he does at Link Church today. And he says, you know that person you've been fantasizing about? You know that person that you feel will satisfy your love? You know that person? Here I am. You can have me. You can have me, I'm here. As he rose from the dead, that means if he's risen, he's risen and he's here today. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Wow, he's here in a physical way. I wanna show you how palpable this is. You know, in the old days, um, um, uh, prophets and, and people, they would, they would venerate their graves. They did it for Muhammad in Medina. They, the Muslims do a pilgrimage in their lives. They go there and they just go around and around and they pay their thing to Muhammad. They do the same for Buddha. And he's somewhere, I don't know, and Confucius as well. I don't know where he went, but he's there. They got a grave for him. And the early church did that too. They had for St. Peter and for this guy. And you know that Stalin, the, the, the great communist? They got his body in state. The, the Russian 
a government pays one and a half million dollars a year just to keep his body in the same position. And people from around the world go and pay their homage there. They put up a shrine around him. But you know what's amazing? Is the early church lost the grave of Jesus. If you go to Jerusalem and I've been there, there are three sets of different religions that tell you this is where Jesus is. You know what? None of them know. They don't know. Why? Why did the early church lose the grave? Because it was never about the grave or the grave clothes. It was because Jesus was alive. Friends, friends, I wanna tell you, he's alive. You see, you see, you see, you know what? When, you got, when, you, when, you, when you've lost someone, you look after their, their shoes and their clothes, you know, you, 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 you honor that. That's like, because that's how you remember them. But I know it is true because I'm a parent. If your children are alive and they leave their shoes and their clothes on the floor, you tell, put the shoes and the clothes away. Because it's not about the shoes and clothes. It's because you have them. Friends, we don't have to worry about where the grave is because Jesus is alive and he walks into our heart and he says, peace be with you. Peace is not the absence of problems. It's the presence of a savior in our lives. And I come into your life and I live with you and that longing and that fantasizing, you can have me. Have me. How beautiful. What a gift. Peace be with you. The second thing he does is he gives us purpose. A gift, a treasure gift from Jesus. He says, here we go. And you know what he, why? Because he calls his early followers. You know what he calls them? Witnesses. He says, you're a witness. In other words, you know what he was saying? There is something that is, you've seen that's gonna shape your life. What Jesus did is he said, I'm come to reorientate your lives and I'm gonna send you. You know, one of the things, how do you know that you know Jesus? Anyone? Okay, no one. How do, you, how do you know that you know Jesus? You know how you know? You're a go ye kind of person. Go ye into all the world. Go ye. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's something that happens in your heart that when you encounter Jesus and you know him, you're never gonna sit still for too long. You're gonna arrive at church and yes, you're gonna be inspired, but you, you, you're sitting in your chair and you know that I wasn't just born for a chair to be inspired. I'm gonna get out my chair and ask the church, where can I help to serve? I'm gonna be that person that says, you know what? God did something in me. I know Jesus, he's up me. And guess what? I'm a go ye kind of person. I'm so grateful for go ye kind of person. Do you think, look at, look at the early disciples. They didn't hang around in Jerusalem like, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't stay in one place. A fire burned so deep inside of them, they said, listen, we're gonna be a go ye kind of person. I'm gonna get into my neighborhood, into my city. I'm gonna go and take the gospel because that's what I was called to do. Sent on a mission. I've been sent and what I see has shaped me. You might not have seen Jesus, but you read the word. Have you seen it? Have you seen the early believers? Early believers on Friday, they were scared, selfish. I'm done. The Monday the Spirit comes, changes them. They become the most bravest, courageous people on this earth. What happened? They saw something. What did they see? They saw Jesus rose again from the dead. And you know what? They thought to themselves, if Jesus could raise him from the dead, he can do it for me too. Wow. Send me God. Because what I see will shape my life. I wanna just give you two things around purpose that maybe help you. Because he comes to give us this gift. Purpose is not found in trying to chase your passion. Purpose is found in coming to the purpose giver. And you know, I thought about it. My, my dad, when he grew up, he taught us how to box. So he had two things, jab, jab, and then a big punch. Left, left, right. And I thought there's two things, left and right. There's two things that you can remember on purpose. The first is you are free from the world. Free from it. You're free from what? You're free from the hold of the material world. The resurrection reminds me that Jesus Christ came to renovate the world. He came to renovate it, which means he didn't just come to console us. He came to restore us, restore us. It's not that I'm gonna go into heaven and float there. Mm. Um, He's coming back, new heaven, new earth, and he's part of renovating it. And so part of it being free from the world, I don't know about you, but I think in today's terms, uh, it's true. I mean, we are, we're held by this material world. We've got lots of storage units. <laughs> yeah, and in the Midlands. <laughs> it, it's, everyone's storing something. I'm not sure what for, but anyway, we store. We like to. It's just part of our thing. And, and, and in, in many ways, it shows like we, we're holding on to like earthly possessions. It's, it's almost like when Jesus comes again, it's the end. No, but the Bible tells me when he comes again, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. Oh, 
You know how much hope this gives people that have born with, born with deformities or born with a thing? You know, what this, you know how much hope that gives those people that didn't get what they wanted here on this earth? Jesus goes, no, 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 my friend, I'm gonna give you a new body. I'm gonna give you new health. I'm gonna give you, I, I'm purifying this universe of all sin, disease, and sickness, and injustice. And you know what? It's not the end, it's just the beginning. I think we live with this frantic sort of anxiety in our hearts sometimes. I don't know about you, but online media and social media does it, you know? We look at that guy. Look what he did. He, counted, count, he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Look at that person. They went to Cape Town, <laughs> whatever. And look at, look at those people. Look at those people. Look at those people. And so what we live with this thing of like, oh, I better do this too. And, we, and we're terrified by we're not, we're not gonna get the bucket list done. But the story of the resurrection means, listen, you don't have to, if you didn't learn to dance like Michael Jackson on earth, one day you're gonna do it on a new heaven, a new earth. If you didn't, if you didn't get to go to the Alps, one day you can have all eternity to walk around the Alps. You know what God's saying? Just relax for a moment. Just because it didn't work out like you think, just relax. The early church lived with poise and power and patience because they said, you know what? If it be, I have all eternity to be at right with him. All eternity. Some of us are chasing the rabbit, just chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing. God says, hey, the resurrection is not just consolation, it's full restoration. Full restoration. Guys, we're getting a new body back. Oh, Shay, I'm excited about this. <laughs> I'm getting my hair back. <laughs> no, it's true, it's true, friends. We, we, we see it, what's it gonna do? Less anxiety, just reacts. God is in control. We can trust him. I'm free from the material world. And the punch, the knockout punch is, I'm, but yet I'm free for it. Which means, because our thinking sometimes is, oh God, thank you for what you did. I'm gonna escape to heaven. But it's never been about escaping to heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, the full restoration of God is coming to bring everything back in order here on earth. In other words, we weren't born to escape it, we were born to engage it. We were born to live on this earth to make a difference. We are part of those people that are bringing it back for God. I remember Martin Luther said this, they asked Martin Luther, the great German theologian, they said, Martin Luther, if Jesus is coming back tomorrow, what are you gonna do? Now, now, just think about that question for a moment. Imagine you, someone said Jesus is coming back tomorrow and you told some people they think you're crazy, am I right? But then you know what you, I would do? I'd probably get in my bed and go like, Jesus, th please forgive me. <laughs> Make sure I'm right with you. You know, then I tell my family. You know what Martin Luther did, did? He got in his car and he drove down to the local nursery. <whistles> Can I have a tree, please? Took a tree, went back home and he planted a tree. And I'm thinking, plant a tree. And if you ask the question why, it shows that our theology of resurrection is a little bit, why would he plant a tree? I asked the question, why? Because he knew if he planted a tree and Jesus came back tomorrow, you know how that tree's gonna flourish? You know how that tree's gonna grow? Psalm 96 says that the trees are gonna clap their hands in heaven. In other words, when Jesus comes back, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. It's the same when he came 2,000 years ago. The kingdom of God hit the ground. The spirit fell on ordinary people and God started to work his story. You know what he's doing? He's in the renovation business and he's using you and I. You and I get to play a part in the eternal story of God. You in that little business, you in that schoolroom, you on that sports field, you in that boardroom. All of us have an opportunity to participate with God to bring renovation on earth. Wow, how good God is. That means my basic everyday life is not just an ordinary thing that I hope for the best. God says what you do counts for eternity. What a privilege. I'm free from the material world and I'm free for it. I'm gonna engage with everything I had because God is purifying this, this, uh, this world. He's taking all injustice. Link Church, continue to fight for injustice. Continue to fight for freedom. Continue to fight with love in your heart. Continue to invite those who've never known the gospel before because God is using us to renovate the world. He gives us peace. He offers us himself. He says, here I am to a thirsty world that's looking for change. He says, I'm new. If you have me, you have life. There is an opportunity for a start again. There's an opportunity to start new again. He gives us peace and then he gives us purpose. He sets us line. What you've seen will shape your world. God, I'm not just gonna be in this world. I'm gonna engage in it. And the last one is he gives us power. Power. 
One of the prayers I pray often is, God, I'm, I'm weak, I need your power. I'm not very clever, I need your wisdom. I, I, I battle sometimes to understand what you're doing. I need to trust you. Help me, God, please. But my first prayer is, God, I'm weak, I need your power. And you know what he says? He says, I'm gonna give you power. What, 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 was the, what is the power of the Holy Spirit? I thought maybe the power of the Holy Spirit is so that I could jump over big walls. I thought that the power of the Holy Spirit is that I could just, I could be, I don't know, like, I don't know, you, you know what you think? You think like, well, so that I could be a, come up with greater strategies and do that. And not that that doesn't happen, but you know why the Holy Spirit was given to give us power? Why? You know why it came? To help you change your character. How do you know that the power of the Holy Spirit's living in your life? You know how you know? You're less grumpier than you were a year ago. Some of the wives are hitting their husbands. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you know the Holy Spirit is in your life with power? You're more loving than you were a year ago. How do you know that the Holy Spirit's in your life? You just, you're more kind and compassionate than you were a year ago. A year ago, that makes make you angry, but now it's like, oh, I just love them for who they are. I'm less judgmental. For those are the fruits of the Spirit. But you know, as I close here, I think, uh, I think of Jesus. You know what He does? In His glorified body, He shows them the nail prints. Do you see that? He shows them. Now, I would have thought a glorified body comes back. Why would He have nail prints? Why does He show them their weakness? He says, look, 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 look at my nails. Look, in my feet, in my hands. Why do that? Well, I think, I think the early disciples were a lot like you and I. Before he went to the cross, you know, they were like, oh, Jesus, my king. He's gonna take out the Romans. He's gonna be the king and he's gonna set up Jesus King Ministries around the world. And I'm gonna hang on his coattails. I'm gonna be in his government. You know, they were doing that. Matthew, we, we like that too, aren't we? Oh, Jesus came my life. I'm just going to be successful in everything I do. Whoa! And then the cross came. And it just put their world upside down. But Jesus walks into the room and he shows them this. You know why? You know why? He points to me. He goes, look, 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 look. What you thought, you thought the nails were going to ruin you, but the nails are actually going to save you. You thought the cross was the end of it, but the cross was just the beginning of me changing your life forever. You thought, now, now I don't know about you, but you, you know those movies we like to watch? You know the ones that are like, the ones we like to watch are the ones with happy endings. Two million in the box office, bad ending, doesn't get much. 200 million in the box office, the movie has a, a, a happy ending. And you know how those movies go? They go like this, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, unexpected turn, hero steps in, boo! And then we start to cry at the end of the movie. We don't like to show it though. Like, it touches our hearts. But you know what the gospel is? The gospel's got one up on those movies. You know what the gospel is? Bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing. Resurrection, God takes it all. But you know what he does with the bad things? He doesn't push away our suffering. He takes the bad things and he uses all those to culminate into our greatest joy. You know what God does for us? He takes the biggest pain in our life, the regret, the biggest thing we grieve over. He takes all those things and He uses it for our good and His glory. Wow! A God that takes my most painful moments, my regrets and my mistakes, God says, don't you just hold on, my friend. I'm gonna turn this out so good for you, you won't even be able to comprehend with your eyes what I've done. What a God we serve. For people in the room going, ah, oh, I regret the mistakes. I've made those mistakes over my family. I regret, I regret. God says, don't you worry yet. It isn't finished yet. Think about Mary. The tomb's empty. They've taken him. My life's finished. Mary, just wait three days, my man. It's about to change around. God, you think it's empty. You think it's ruined. God says, I'm still working. Working for your good and my glory. You know, I, uh, I look at this early church and I think, 
I was saying earlier, I think we, we've gone up to Hilton, but there's some things that have happened in our family that are unexplainable. Just some things that have gone down. It's, it's our th- story, but it's unexplainable. Have you ever had something in your life that's unexplainable? It just comes out of nowhere. Left field. You didn't even see it coming. Boom. And you know what I want to do? I want to try and explain the unexplainable. I know you like me. You go like, oh my God, what did that happen? And, you know, and then we try and explain it and explain the unexplainable. But God said, look at the early believers. There were unexplainable things that happened to them. Their property was taken. Some of them were martyred. They lost their families. They lost their birthright. All those things, big things, unexplainable. But you know what they did? They took the unexplainable and by faith, they put it underneath the undeniable. The undeniable The undeniable is the truth of God that says, I rose from the dead. And if I rose from the dead, you're a child of God. The undeniable is you might be in the deepest valley, but I am with you. The undeniable is I have the final word over humanity. I'm building my story. The undeniable is he's invited you and I into the greatest story ever. The undeniable is we have grace over our lives. The undeniable is that we've been forgiven of our sins and we have freedom inside our hearts. The undeniable is we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. When the unexplainable, look, look, because the unexplainable is going to come to us. And you might be young in the room and go, oh, you know, no, I've got life sorted out. I'm fine. No, 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 no. The unexplainable is going to come. The question I want to ask is, what are you going to do when it does? Because you know what? Faith isn't about you mustering it up. God, look at my faith. Look at my faith. No, faith is a gift from God. Go to Jesus and he'll give you that gift with your doubts, with everything and stand under the undeniable word of God and the promise of God that says yes and amen to every promise in him. I wanted to close with a story. I was on a beach in Msakaba and uh, you go past Lusiki Siki and they drop to the ocean. I often say when we get there, it's like God's already renovated that part of the beach for heaven. It's, it's unbelievable. It has this beautiful estuary, 8 k's long, 75 meters deep, deepest freshwater estuary in the southern hemisphere. I walk along that beach, the milkweeds, the rock island where you fish off the ocean in your ears. It's like, it's like heaven's already there. I'm on the beach and I meet this family, the raw family from Coxstad. So we start talking and I say, hey, James, how's Coxstad doing? He reckons Coxstad is thriving. He says, the city's alive. And I'm like, Woo! I drove through it, I saw it. He said, no, and there's young farmers coming back and they, they're farming well. It's, it's amazing that the town is alive with people. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And he says, but have you heard of this place called Twist Valley? I said, Twist Valley? He said, there's a little suburb in Coxstead called Twist Valley. It's a colored, little colored community that live in Twist Valley. But he says, you know, it's not just about the name. Let me tell you what happens in Twist Valley. I said, oh, really? He said, yes. Some of the greatest South African school sportsmen come from Twist Valley. SA schools, cricketers, hockey players, rugby players. The schools go and do clinics there twice a year to find them. Twist Valley. The legend goes at night, they got those street lights and they crush tin cans and they play on the tar road like hockey, like ice hockey in winter. Those guys are so good, they'll step you in a phone booth. So as he's telling me the story, my cousin who's at Hilton College, grade 12, he says, Mark, you won't believe it. I've got two boys in my dorm from Twist Valley. SA schools cricket, SA schools rugby. And I thought to myself, wow, man, I wanna go and visit Twist Valley. But you know what I love about this story? You know what the story that's told, you know what the grandfathers tell the people in Twist Valley? They say, you know what? You might have been born in this valley, but this is no ordinary valley. This is Twist Valley. This means there's no cap on the potential you have. You might have started down in the valley of sin, but God twisted us and gave us hope and a freedom and a future. You might have been outside the story and thought you were never born in for it, but God wants to remind the church you were born in Twist Valley, which means the resurrection power can change your story around. Jesus stands in front of humanity and says, listen, my friends, there's a twist to the story. I was once dead but now I'm alive. I was once cast out, but now I'm being cast in. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once lost, but now I've been found. Praise God that we stand in the Twist Valley. Praise God because He's on our side. Praise God because He set us free. I don't stand in an ordinary valley. I stand in Twist Valley and the story's not over yet. God's still working His plan through me for my good and His glory.